puedes pasar las diapositivas, Mariana? O... ¿Me, las, ¿Me las mandas o es la última sí. versión? Que se uh -huh. No, es la última de antes, o si no, yo lo que hago es eh, las leo y no las paso. ¿no? ¿La preparo? Solo si, si, si ves que se cae, si ves que se cae, solo las leo. Y Entro, las ok. Ah, ok. Yo voy a intentarlo, pero creo que se va a caer el, el internet. No, 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 no. Libre intento. ¿Se oye, ¿se oye al menos? Sí, sí. Se escucha mejor. Lo acabo de mandar, María. Sí, acá las tengo, las que dicen que son nueve diapositivas. No, no le oímos, Javier, tu flash. No, estamos bloqueados hasta que abran el... hasta que empiece el evento. En teoría ya nos deben hacer la conexión. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, sisters and brothers. Welcome all to the Food and Agriculture Pavilion. It is a real pleasure to welcome you to the event Indigenous People and Produce Organizations Upscaling Biocentric Climate Action. Let me introduce myself. My name is Vyacheslav Shadrin. I am a Grand Chief of Yukagir People and leads Yuka Council of Yukagir Elders. And I have the honor to be the moderator of this important discussion today. I would like to thank the Forest and Farm Facility, the FAO Indigenous Peoples Unit, and USCNI for organizing this event that aims to promote a discussion and generate great understanding about the role of indigenous people's food and knowledge systems in protecting and gen regenerating ecosystem and biodiversity. In particular, we will discuss how to promote the restoration of territories and the protection of bio biodiversity through a more inclusive model and from a biocentric point of view, which means centric on the whole ecosystem and not anthropocentric, not centric on humans and the benefits that humans can obtain from biodiversity. I also would like to thank the audience that is here today in person and to all the people that is watching the live stream of this event. Thank you for joining us. And first, I want to invite to our panel uh, Eileen Marian Cunningham, uh, Chris Bass, and Amy Dushal. Yes. To start, I would like to pass the floor to Eileen Maria Marina Cunningham, Mosquito People research and advocacy officer of the Center for Indigenous Peoples Autonomy and Development. Please. Good morning to everyone, and thank you, Vishla, for, for your presentation. Um, thank you to FAO for the invitation to be today to discuss these important issues about indigenous people. Um, the role of indigenous people in biodiversity and, and conservation and climate action has been recognized by different stakeholders at global level. We still have the big challenge that the state parties are not seeing this. In the past discussion in Glasgow and also in this COP and in the Biodiversity COP as well as the UN Food System Summit, there was a strong point about the governance, the knowledge, the food system of indigenous people, and how all these are really vital for the regulation, the conservation of biodiversity, and also about the importance for the sustainable food system at global level. We remember that in COP26, there was this 1.7 pledge for indigenous people um, 1.7 billion for indigenous people for protecting and restoring forests, but that is another <laughs> discussion. 
But that is one acknowledge of the importance of the work that indigenous people are doing in their land, territories, and resources. Even if we don't see it like a work, we see it like our livelihood or way of life. But now um, we know that most of the biodiversity in the planet is in indigenous people, lands, and territories. Even we are only the 6% of the population at global level, we, um, we held collectively almost 28% of the, of the best restored um, ecosystem in the world, and 18% of all the biodiversity of the world. But that's all these are good things that indigenous people system have. But we have a lot of challenge around this. We see that most of the implementation of climate actions are going on without the full and effective participation of indigenous people. And we feel that we are the knowledge holder, the right holder. We are the key actor that should be included in all this discussion. So we always ask, what do we have to do? So the government see this. Because we have allies like FAO and other uh, UN system um, organization, other alliance around the world. But the most important for the recognition of our right is our state, our government, and they're not seeing our, our work in this. We, we also seen during this, this COP, there is a lot of discussion about uh, initiatives that are launching in the name of indigenous people. They're talking about direct access to fund, but there is always one fund that is developed so indigenous people can access to this. This is not direct ac access to fund. The other thing is that indigenous people are not included adequately in this because there is a lack of transparency in a lot of these um, funds that are developing here. We see USA, USAID, we see, um, there is a lot of, <laughs> of funds that you can see around. I think two days ago there was four different <laughs> activities, side events, where they were talking about access to funds for indigenous people and the development of a specific dedicated fund for this. But I, I asked to myself, why so many? And why we have to develop one fund if we have the capacity to, to implement, to receive these funds? I know there is a lot of discussion that indigenous people don't have the capacity. Yes, we need to strong strain our capacity, but we have shown that indigenous people have the capacity to lead process at local level. So that's why it's important this discussion today with indigenous people. That's important to know how indigenous people are promoting biodiversity conservation and the um, ecosystem restoration. Um, I believe that global and national climate action plans are facing actually a dichotomy either to ensure that the biodiversity restoration and conservation initiative go hand in hand with cosmogony of indigenous people, respecting our collective right and knowledge or the conservation and restoration initiative will not only work, but be also be contraproducent. We say that if indigenous people are not included in the process, uh, how are you going to do process top down still when we are at local level, we are um, pushing for action in our territories. And we have seen other examples of process that of conservation that don't include indigenous people and are really bad examples in Africa, in Latin America. And these are ideas that came from the 70s, from these things that the nature is pristine and the, there is no one there. But the true, the reality, is indigenous people are in all this natural uh, ecosystem. So it's important the inclusion of indigenous people because what we have to discuss now, and most of the activities say we don't have to do harm, it's fine, but that is basic. 
what all these activities of restoration, conservation should think is how to do better, how to go one step ahead. And to do better also include the participation of indigenous people, the, not only in the decision making, but also in the implementation. And I think indigenous people have been discussed for years that it's important to be seen like not, not more like beneficiaries, but partners of the process. We are really actors of change, and we want to be part of the process because we are already doing um, pro actions in our, in our local level. That's why I just want to leave you with three main messages. The first one is that restoration, conservation, and climate action initiative must incorporate indigenous people in the planning, decision making, also monitoring and implementation. And they have to consider this biocentric vision of indigenous people, where the human are not the center, but we are a balance, an element of all this. And I think this biocentric idea is, in fact, all the idea, all the vision that indigenous people have, how we live, how we have lived for decades or, or uh, I don't know, <laughs> historic times. So also, indigenous people knowledge is so important for food and territorial management system. And it's important to learn of this, recognize that the, these are part in, in our daily life, in our livelihood, in our way of live, in our cosmovision. And if we don't include this, there is going to be all these negative issues uh, that can affect our land's territories or culture. And the other thing is like, it's important to see the collective right of indigenous people like the glue that hold together the community system to preserve the forests, the seas, and all the elements that exist in our lands and territories. So climate action, restoration, and conservation should respect, should promote, and should include indigenous people and our all, uh, value system. And thank you, and I'm happy to be here, and I'm happy to hear from the other panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen. Now I would like to give the floor to Chris Bass, director of the UCN Center for Economy and Finance. Please, your floor. Thank, thank you very much, and, uh, and wonderful opening words, Eileen. And I was really just, I, I, I have to riff up my script because I think you've said it all and the importance of messaging. Um, I, I, I come, I've been here at, in, in, in Sharm El Sheikh, I have three hats. The first one is uh, I'm the director for the Center for Economy for Fi of Finance for IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, um, where we, we work, um, have a very right-centered approach, um, and also we have an indigenous people's membership organization. IUCN is a, is a massive beast, it's a conversation on the side, I won't even try and describe it now. Um, I have also worked very closely with the, for we have, we're a partner in the Forest and Farm Facility, one of the organizers of this event, um, who work very closely in building the capacity of, of, of farmers, smallholders, working with indigenous peoples groups, both on a policy, policy engagement level, but also in mobilizing and building, building capacities. And then also um, working on a, an initiative on regenerative agriculture called Regen 10, um, and that, that was launched last year at the World Leaders Summit um, and looking at, at re regenerating food systems and transforming the, the, the food systems. I think, I think you know, I, 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 my, my word is, and Eileen's word is, is as, and the rest of the, rest of the panelists is, 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 is ten times more powerful. But, but at, at the heart of I, I say those those three sort of aspects that I've been working on, not just because I want to tell you what I've been working on, but because at, at the heart of at the heart of those is is people, cult, cu people, culture, nature, nature-based solutions, um, and I think it's thrilling to be here um, now and see the role. I mean, if you go back even just two or three years, nature, culture, people um, weren't centre to some of the discussions on on climate. You know, if you talked about nature in particular, everyone, and, and you talked about nature, so no, that's, that's, that, 
CB, that CBD. You go there, you talk in the Convention on Biological Diversity, you don't talk about that. This is climate finance, this is what we're talking here. Um, but the shift towards resilience and land use and agriculture, and I think as you, as you walk around the, and, and you get lost around the thousand buildings that we're trying to find ourselves, it's, it's amazing how many focus on agriculture and, 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 and are focused on people. Um, so I think in, in, in all of those areas of work is making sure that we are responsive, we're, we're farmer driven, we're responsive to the needs of indigenous peoples and, and then building on that holistic approach um, that, that, that you mentioned Eileen and making sure that we have integrated systems um, to, to respond to not just climate change, um, challenges, but also the longer term challenges, uh, also the other longer term challenges of, of resilience um, for, to, to climate change, but also the short term climate change shocks that just the flash flooding, etc., that we're seeing more and more of. And, and, and nature and nature based solutions and, and, and people are, are set at the center of that. Um, today is, I, I've lost myself, but I think today is Biodiversity Day, it's Oceans Day. Um, there's the Egyptian presidency is, is running a big initiative on nature-based solutions to take through to COP28. So these things are these things are happening, and I think what is just so important is that we do have we do have indigenous peoples' voices at the table, but not just not just a voice, but actually shaping the the way the, these conversations are going and being responsive. Um, I think. Uh, the, the finance, Eileen, you mentioned the finance. I have my role with the ec economics work. I think is just just so central, and I like I love the way you 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 change the angle of approach of we this top down funding. Well, it's supposed to be top down funding, but we're not seeing much of it mobilised. But the top down funding that you talk about actually should be turned around, and and it should be the the indigenous peoples are saying right, we need this type of finance. This is what will help us rather than, 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 than globally sort of d decided, globally driven processes. But I, and I think also in, in a lot of this work, we talk about learning, sharing, um, uh, and uh, the knowledge and understanding of what the holistic systems look like. And, and to me, that's a bit of a conundrum, and I would love to have form of, more formal discussions on that, because well, then your uh, indigenous peoples and, and farmers, they, 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 uh, they're the owners of that knowledge. Um, they bring that knowledge. And, and uh, yes, it's very important that both the global north and global south respond and, and learn on that knowledge. But we don't want to appropriate that knowledge. It's important that we, we respect the knowledge. Where does it come from? And I think that's a really interesting challenge for us to, <clears throat> for us to take on and, and make sure that we are that appropriation doesn't doesn't happen and we, we see it a lot with with biomedicines etc but i think as we we now shift to to actually pr traditional practices and traditional knowledge and bringing that in and it's a really really interesting discussion and a really important conversation and i think in the title of this we did talk about rights and it's not just about land rights it's about knowledge rights and and it, it's for me this is this is uh, my big sort of conf my big no, my, my small brain with a big challenge of worrying it over of how we actually take on that challenge and we could say, you know, I, I've talked about regenerative agriculture and how we must learn and share and then I sort of suddenly go, oh, hang on, well, there's, there's implications there. What, what are we actually hearing? What are we saying and what are we doing? And I think there needs to be systems in place where we talk about learning and sharing and it's a, I don't have an answer, but it's just, just very important. So, and then just to, just to finish off, um, I think, and, and I'm going to use, use Eileen's words, and, and this is, uh, I'm second on the panel. Normally I end up last, and it's great because you can use everyone else's words, but Eileen did such a good job that I, I still have loads of quotes. And I, I loved yours, Eileen, when you said, do, do no harm, but do better as well. And I think that so far we've been, in, we've been focused on that do no harm, um, but the do better is, is really what we need to strive for and, and, and how we use that knowledge to na nature-based solutions, nature integrated, biocentric, holistic um, is, is so important, but by making sure, but also making sure we don't do harm at the same time, because sometimes we can do better, but actually we end up doing some harm as well. So um, I'm, I'm really excited to go and sit down and listen. 
um, and and hear more and then get that that thinking of 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 the opportunity around biocentric approaches and and how we move forward. So just thank you for the opportunity for some opening words on behalf of the Forest and Farm Facility and IUCN and then also bringing in the work we're doing on regenerative agriculture. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And I would like now to give floor to Amy Duschel, FAO, Forest and Climate Team Leader, please. Thank you so much, and it's really an honor for me to be here with you today and Eileen again together. Um, I, I, and I would also like to thank my colleagues at FAO for organizing this really important important session that from the Indigenous Peoples Unit and the Forest and Farm Facility, including um, Jan Fernandez de Ladinoa, who we'll hear from on the next panel, who heads up that unit. Um, you know, I think at FAO, we, we no longer talk about forest-based climate action without immediately talking about the central role of indigenous peoples in that. And I think maybe that sounds sort of small, but I think it's important. And we've gotten to that place because of all the work you've done. Um, you know, 15 years ago when you were saying, no rights, no red, this started the indigenous people's leadership and space in the, the forest-based climate agenda and has only strengthened over time to the point that the international organizations are following you. I mean, this is, it's, it's, it's part of um, the fundamentals of, kn of knowing how we're going to address these challenges. So, I mean, thank you for the fight over all of these years and for staying, staying in this. Um, I think the other thing that sort of struck me though that this week, you know, I've been in several sessions with Indigenous Peoples representatives who are still saying, we need to be treated like partners. Please respect us. And it, it actually, it makes me sad to he that we have to hear that still, because um, we should be beyond that already where we're, this is happening, and, and that um, you, you are leading this, and that you are the partners, you know, the, the, the leader partners, in fact, and we're following and supporting. And so I think, of course, we still need to do better, even though this is already at the top of, of the agenda. Um, you know, Eileen and Chris, you both, I mean, nicely articulated the, the central role of indigenous peoples in protecting forests, in managing agrobiodiversity outside of forests, organic soil um, that are fundamental not only to environmental conservation, but also food security. And, and we're in the food and agriculture pavilion, and so this is a, it's an important discussion also to have here about indigenous food systems. And I think the, the main things that we're really trying to focus in on are the, the issues of rights and the issues of finance. And so, you know, we understand that, you know, the collective rights of indigenous peoples are fundamental to be able to continue the protagonist role in climate, in, in forest-based climate action. Um, the FAO FILAC report from 2021 was the latest evidence on how you really, <laughs> there's more and more evidence, but you know, it's very clear that if, you know, intact, high integrity forests are in indigenous territories and, and those need to be um, respected and supported. And then getting the finance to the ground. So we do have these pledges, and I do think they're important. So I, I, I think, you know, the, the, the more that, that this, you know, the 1.7 billion was important for, for the attention that it brought. And now the trick really is to ensure that as that spending continues over the next three years, until 2025, that it's really going to the right places. And, you know, the donors of that fund are saying they're on track with the spending and now we need to sort of understand really how that's being channeled. And, and it's not impossible to get funds to the ground. And I think what's interesting about these pledges is that it is forcing many different actors to rethink some of these financial mechanisms and, and the new sort of ways of channeling, channeling funds. And I'm thinking of the, you know, the Alianza Mesoamericana de Pueblos y Bosques and the Mesoamerican Territorial Fund and, and sort of different examples of, of, of ways to make this happen and, and, and um, you know, hear from you all on whether and how this is working well. So again, you know, FAO is here as a partnership, and I think 
something else that as real partners that we need to do is transform our own organizations. And I do want to thank you know, the Indigenous Peoples Unit at FAO because there is a call for transforming within FAO to be able to truly become partners with Indigenous peoples on, on these nature-based climate solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thank you to all our panelists for their very important remarks to our discussions. Thank you. And let me invite to the panel our next panelists. Please, uh, Jessica Vega, Irish Bagula, Lucy Mullenke, and Kati Partanen. Please, I invite you to floor. We will now hear from the panelists who are joining us today to address this discussion on how to include a more biocentric vision on, in climate action, ensuring the inclusion of the knowledge of rural producers and respecting and promoting the collective rights and ancestral knowledge of indigenous peoples. Dear panelists, thank you very much for your participation today. We kindly ask you not to exceed the three minutes allotted to each of you. And sorry if I take this card and show you that your time is over. <laughs> yes. And I would like to give the floor to Jon Fernandez de la Rinoa, head of the FAO Indigenous Peoples Unit. Welcome, Jon. Are you here? Jon? He must be online. Welcome, Jon. And can you explain why a more inclusive approach to biodiversity conversation and ecosystem restoration is urgently needed and kindly describe what is meant by a biocentric approach to biodiversity conversation and restoration. Please, Flossio. Thank you, thank you so much and good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you, Brother Vyacheslav, and let me convey my greetings to Aileen, to Chris, uh, to Amy and of course to Jessica Eilis and, um, and my sister Lucy Mulinke. I'm going to be talking about uh, a biocentric approach for biodiversity conservation and why it is so important that we all start recognizing the rights to living entities. So we move from this anthropocentric way of life towards a much more biocentric that recognizes the rights of existence, of ecosystems, of nature, of forests, of lakes, detached from the utilitarian uh, um, use that humans very often do. We tend to look at things with an ultimate use and benefit for us, and unless we start recognizing the rise of existence of different uh, ecosystems by themselves, we will not move from anthropocentric to biocentric. And this is something that indigenous peoples have been teaching us for years, and we have had a hard time listening. But it's time, if we are serious about climate action that we learn from them and we put nature at the center. Let me move to the next slide. Mariana is helping me with the presentation. And some of the things that I would like to share with you that we have learned with indigenous peoples through the Global Hub, through the Coalition on Indigenous Peoples Food Systems, through the joint research that we are doing in the field, is that for indigenous peoples, their land, their territories is sacred. Everything starts in their land and territories. It's the heart of their identity, spirituality, is their health, is their well-being, and uh, this is why they are ready to defend it until the last drop of their blood. Their food systems are ecosystems. And a take-home message I want to put forward is that we cannot protect ecosystems and biodiversity if we don't support indigenous people's food and knowledge systems. They can generate more than 100 species that are used for foods, medicines, and byproducts. And let us don't forget that indigenous peoples lives in some of the more pristine ecosystems of the world, but more importantly, they are the larger, largest domesticators of wild and semi-wild varieties. So they are really the ones that are in close contact with the wild varieties, and they are capable of, through observation, to domesticate still several of these. But access to land and natural resources is the first driver of food security for indigenous peoples. This was already enshrined in the right to food in 2004. This is three years 
before the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, already in FAO, uh, it was recognized that without land and territories, there cannot be food security for indigenous peoples. And this is essential, essential if we want to achieve SDG number two on zero hunger. On the next slide, please, Mariana, I'm going to talk about how a large fraction of the world terrestrial biodiversity is in indigenous peoples' territories. And there's a, a very important overlapping between cultural and language diversity, biodiversity, and indigenous peoples' territories. And unless we start to understand this in the different protection efforts, we will not be able to protect biodiversity. Very often, we displace indigenous peoples from across the world, and this is a disservice to humanity, and of course, it's a crime against indigenous peoples. And indigenous women are central. They shouldn't not go unnoticed. You'll just listen to uh, Aileen, and we have two very powerful panelists right after. They are really the carriers of this knowledge. They are the carriers of the seeds. They are the ones that know about medicinal plants. They are the ones that maintain the ecosystem. Very often they go unnoticed, and it was a large satisfaction to see so many indigenous women at COP27 because really they are the solution and the way forward. Indigenous people's cosmogony is all rooted on biocentric approach. Most of the indigenous beliefs and the spiritual rights, they worship the sacrality that they see in nature around them. And there's so much to learn from other religions and there's so much to learn from other approaches to natural management. In the next one, please. Next slide. But there are many challenges. And of course, the lack of recognition of indigenous peoples and the lack of understanding of their collective rights the governance, how they manage communal uh, territories is really a problem for all of us. And it's resulting in violence and it's result resulting in deaths. And interestingly enough, the COVID-19 pandemic did not stop the killings and the violence against indigenous peoples. Actually, it increased, and we saw that during 2020 and 2021. There is more and more extractive pressure on natural resources, conservation policies, and legal uncertainty over indigenous people's lands and territories. And this is resulting in evictions, displacements, and forced relocation. And it's very interesting to notice how a lot of the discussions about green and clean energy are also being, becoming side effects on indigenous peoples who see a lot of the new developments of uh, energy in their territories without their consent, and this is creating uh, more violence and more insecurity. And of course, the lack of security over indigenous people's lands is creating criminalization, imprisonment, and killing for defending their homes and for defending the lands where their elders are buried. This is really nonsense, uh, and we need to stop this together, and it's it's very important uh, what the colleagues were mentioning at the opening, that the funding goes straight to indigenous peoples so that they can be empowered and they can guarantee the lack of access to their lands. In the next slide, I'm going to be talking already about what is biocentric restoration. We have been working with indigenous peoples for several years, and together we develop an approach to restore degraded lands putting indigenous uh, biocentric and cosmogony beliefs at the center. And basically it is about a new model of conservation and preservation and restoration that recovers the memory of the territory thanks to the cosmogony, the beliefs and the knowledge of indigenous peoples. And it empowers indigenous peoples, particularly indigenous women at the community so that they are the ones that carry these biocentric approaches in their lands. They know how they were they know why they are degraded now, and they know how to restore those ecosystems that once were abandoned and were degraded. In the next one, I will be talking about some of the ongoing initiatives that we are carrying out in Ecuador, Peru, Thailand, and India with indigenous peoples. Next one, please. <clears throat> and um, on the take home messages, what I would like to share with you is the importance of recognize that indigenous peoples across the world are the best experts in preserving biodiversity. The fact that they, uh, that they conserve uh, the majority, they say 80% of the remaining biodiversity, it already gives us a hint that they are better than non-indigenous peoples at preserving ecosystems and biodiversity. And obviously their food systems and their knowledge systems are at the center of this success in preserving ecosystems. But the other message is the importance of uh, ensuring that the new biodiversity conservation policies 
do not harm indigenous people's lives and put this knowledge at the center. And to that, they need to include biocentric approaches. Uh, very important is to include indigenous peoples in policy discussions, maintaining parallel uh, events where we have indigenous peoples speaking, but not having them at the negotiation table is not the solution. And last but not least, it's very important to recognize the biocentric restoration approaches as a valid model to preserve biodiversity, but also to recover degraded lands. Um, we need to recognize indigenous peoples to ensure that the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and free prior and informed consent are at the center of any initiative undertaken by UN organizations, governments, private sector, academia, and foundations. And with this, I would like to close by sharing the three ongoing initiatives that FAO is working very closely with indigenous brothers and sisters, the Global Hub on Indigenous Peoples Food Systems. Uh, we together collectively with indigenous organizations uh, wrote the White Wipala paper on indigenous people's food systems and that gave led to the coalition on indigenous people's food systems where we are working with the seven sociocultural regions of the world, seven countries, and already there is interest from foundations, from philanthropics, more countries and more indigenous organizations to join. And then the wrong group of friends of indigenous peoples that gathered 35 countries and has enabled us to have a constant dialogue with countries and to sensitize them more and more about the importance to include indigenous peoples, not only in their delegations when they go to negotiate, but also in the different policies and the different initiatives that they are very often uh, talking about. Thank you so much for your attention and over to you, uh, uh, Brother Vyacheslav. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jon. Now, I would like to give the floor to our second and third panelists, Jessica Vega of the Mixteca Puebla, advisor to the Global Indigenous Youth Caucus, and Irish Bagila of the Asian Farmers Association. Could you kindly share with us your perspective on the in strict connection of collective rights and biodiversity conservation? Jessica as a representative of indigenous peoples and Irish as a representative of farmers. Please. Thank you so much. Dubadi Quindo, Stai, Esnai. Good morning, uh, sisters and brothers. Um, greetings from my different process first uh, because the, like the part or the different process and the local, uh, regional, uh, global level to try to connection the, uh, the ideas from the indigenous youth. Uh, the indigenous youth, we have been looking some years ago uh, to place or the different agendas for to take the boss, but uh, also for to take the action. Uh, the problems by the, by the, the face of the indigenous uh, people is that even though that the practice, the art sep is not separate to the take attention for the problems. Uh, the indigenous youth, we have continued to work when the holistic perspective, like the teacher and the majors. Um, a few days ago, uh, one of the elders leaders mentioned uh, like this, without indigenous people, there is no humanity. And uh, previously, uh, you listen the the people mentioned the greatest protection or the biodiversity and the indigenous is in the territories of the indigenous people. So in my in middle of the this uh, crisis for the mother earth, the indigenous youth to try to also continue to learn from the elders, because it's necessary also recovering the practice and the needed. Uh, to also empower for more generation to take the action. Um, but not only indigenous people, also the indigenous Ayunga, uh, but the no indigenous also needed to again recover in the practice and the war. All the people have the connection when the mother earth, but you need the reconnection, this connection. Because if we not have it, take action in this time, it's possible to not have a humanity. And around the corner, I see a low, a low uh, demonstration like the yesterday one dinosaur or something like this. Uh, and then it's necessary to, to try to imagine what happened if we not take action now. It's the same because still working together for the extermination of the humanity. But we needed to connection 
again for the world together for recovering these practices. For example, recently in my town and the live now because I am live uh, to near at the city uh, to try to recover in first the name. Chico is the one uh, word in the Nahual war that the the one and I mean like the middle tone, uh, but this is the one thing that important for us because uh, Mexico, Mexico is the two words, and then the they they are the mean like the middle on the, the war. This is the one thing important for us because all the wars, all the part or the cosmovision connection when the identity, but also to try to recovering and to try to protect the knowledge, to try to protect the, this process and to try also to love more the part or the US state. This is the one thing the indigenous people also to try to defend the territories that the, they live in. Because it's not also defender the territories, it's also defender your identity, it's also defending your food system, it's also defending the new generation. I, um, I am also uh, to try to say that now FAO have the one commitment and the general action, like the four pillars. But then the one four pillar say the better life. And then if we wanted to better life, we needed to work together for have this better life. Um, but needed also to listen and not only say promise. I needed also to try to work together for the, this generation. Now I have also rivers, lakes, still have the 80% that this biodiversity, the indigenous people say they have in the territories. But uh, in the past of the years, it's not only that, it's more than this. If we not have the, this um, accompaniment or the indigenous people, maybe not have it the next year, the listen, this, this 18%, maybe it's less because yeah, all the time, losing, losing, losing the biodiversity. And then it's necessary also working and take the action. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. So uh, my name is Irish, and I am from the Asian Farmers Association for Sustainable Rural Development from the Philippines. So um, AFA is a, a regional network of farmers organization in 16 countries in Asia with 19 members which are national farmers association composed of uh, small scale far women, men and young farmers involved in crops, livestock, herding and pastoralism. And to respond to, um, to the question, I want to, um, to open or say first that we know Asia is mostly composed of uh, small scale farmers and that we also know that uh, Asia is one of the most uh, biodiverse uh, 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 region in, in the world and at the regional at the regional level how do we exercise our collective rights so as an organization AFA uh, uses uh, our organization our regional organization to to defend to claim and to protect our rights to land and resources. And it's also through our organization that we promote agroecological and sustainable agriculture. And so we have uh, activities such as training, capacity building, and learning exchange. In fact, AWA was established in 2002 um, through a, a regional exchange of national farmers organizations. And they have the leaders, the, farm, the leaders in the past have seen the similarities and differences of the challenges and have formed the organization so they can collectively push and advocate at the international and regional level. So that's the origin of the organization. And also as an organization, we promote uh, cooperative development because we know that small scale farmers are 
are confronting numerous and several challenges. And so we have to collectively also face them because these are complex and huge uh, challenges in, in uh, engaging in, in the market. And also it's through our organization at the regional level that we empower women farmers, young farmers, and, all, and strengthen national level and local level um, organization. And I want to give one example how farmers organization or producers organization exercise their collective rights to resources, to capacity building, rights to be recognized for the multidimensional contribution that we do, including the conservation and preservation and improvement of uh, agrobiodiversity and also our right to uh, participate in this decision making. So one of the cooperative was established through the farm and forest facility in Vietnam. It's called the Yen Duong Agroforestry Cooperative in the northern mountainous region of uh, Vietnam. So the, the cooperative is composed mostly of uh, women and also uh, mostly indigenous uh, peoples in that uh, region. And um, they are very isolated um, and it was very, because they are in the mountainous area, it was difficult for them to engage with their government at the district level and it was difficult for them to engage also in, in the market. And they have formed this uh, cooperative and the women leaders, because they, they are, uh, they, they, they are uh, collectively advocating, they were able to you know, negotiate uh, with their local government, construction of the facility that they would need to be able to, you know, to to um, improve their livelihood. And uh, this, uh, the community of women, they are involved in agroforestry, organic agriculture, and integrated farming. And all these are are helping them uh, build their uh, resilience. And we, I, I don't want to repeat what has been said um, earlier. Um, but I want to build on, on what has been said, that the practices of um, indigenous people, small-scale farmers, are already climate resilient. We are already storing carbon in our soils, in our trees. And uh, we are, uh, you know, uh, the, the biomass uh, that, that we produce and we, uh, we uh, store them back in the soil. So I want to, uh, to end with saying that this Yen Duong cooperative, it is through their uh, cooperative and organization that they are now able to engage um, in agrotourism to diversify their livelihood. And through that, they are able to protect you know, uh, the forest and they are able to protect even the, the culture uh, that they have because they are benefiting from the, the economic services uh, of, of their uh, territory. And it's through their cooperative that they have now increased their capacity uh, through the training that has been done. And it's uh, through their organization that more women leaders are being recognized in, in their uh, community. So yeah, I want to, to stop with that. And I, I hope uh, I was able to emphasize the importance of strengthening, investing in cooperatives, in farmer or producer organization, because it's through these collective uh, and social infrastructures that we are able to really uh, to, to engage with uh, bigger institutions. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jessica and Irish. Now I will pass to the floor to our sister, Lucy Mullenke, she belongs to the Maasai people, and she is co-chair of the Indigenous Women's Biodiversity Network. Lucy, could you kindly share with us an example of restoration of land through indigenous people's knowledge, food systems, and biocentric perspective? Please. Thank you very much, and good morning, everyone, uh, both here and, of course, online. And uh, First and foremost, I would like to thank Yon for his presentation this morning. I think he's almost preempted most of us in the discussion because he brought up quite some important issues when we talk about biodiversity, talk about the women production and, and, and uh, about farming and what the work uh, indigenous women are doing. I think Cunningham also brought up some very important issues which are uh, really very important in terms of looking at the indigenous peoples and looking at the funding climate change and so on. And uh, one of the key issues I think uh, that we should all always appreciate, the fact that indigenous women and indigenous people look at nature as part of them. 
a look at uh, nature as life and also production and everything. Because all what is around us is biodiversity and it has life. And if we can only try to look at that way that we are holistically working together, the nature, the people and everything that is around us, there we can be able to really think twice on what we are doing to the planet today. And that's why we have these problems. And Yon tried to break it out quite well, uh, putting it the scientific way and so on, but we look at it that way as indigenous people, looking at the reality. And every time we are out in the community, you look everyone looking at everything around you. Everything that has life is important and we have to continue. And one of the things that also people tend to forget is that the rural women, the remote er who live in remote areas, either they are living in the highlands, either they are living in the areas where they can be able to, far to farm and uh, uh, do a lot of other um, mountain farming, like what happens in Asia and, and Latin America, and also in Africa and some other parts, and we have dry lands especially in, the area, uh, in Africa, but they also have their own unique ways of food production, of the way that they move in terms of looking at the different issues that they have. Livestock is their life and it's their production. But at the same time, with the impact of climate change, like some of them were here from Sudan, from Sahel, and also from the other parts of, uh, uh, you know, northern part of Kenya, you find that despite the fact that they are in dry lands. They still have that biodiversity that they value. They still work on it as much as possible. And uh, despite the climate change, they have also tried to, uh, to, to, to cope and to be able to have adaptation uh, mechanisms and mitigation so that they can be able to have production of food and, uh, and everything. But one of the things that is lacking, and that is exactly what Cunningham said earlier, is the lack of recognition, lack of support in terms of really improving their own production, in terms of being able to produce what they produce, be able to sell it and be able to do and you know, work a lot of other issues that can really improve their economic empowerment. And I was really a thrill for uh, our sister Irish from uh, uh, Philippines talking about the cooperative, because that's the same thing that the pastoralist communities and the other people living in the region, they would like to do that, but sometimes they are, you know, challenges that are there. But what we can do is all of us to try and learn from each other. It's really important to have that recognition of indigenous people's rights, have the uh, free prior informed consent in terms of looking at their issues. But the challenge again comes on the issues of land, which uh, uh, Yon had mentioned, and I don't want to go deeper into it, especially the issue of land tenure issues, and considering that women don't own land, they, 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 it's just by name and by constitutions, but it never practiced. But there are so many other issues that we can make a change. And I think it's time for action. We really need to work all of us together. We need all the UN agencies, FAOs, to, and others to work together so that we can help indigenous women and indigenous people to be able to scale up on what we are discussing about uh, biocentric climate actions. We should have those actions on the table. We should have them practically. We don't want to be from Glasgow, we talk about the money, we don't know where the money goes, and next year again, I don't know, we are going to the Emirates, and we'll be talking again about something else. Can there be action now so that we can see uh, what uh, things, uh, how we can make a change? It's very important, and a human rights approach is also very crucial, so that when we look at the human rights approach, we also know that we are not leaving anyone behind, no matter how remote they are, no matter where they are, we have to make sure that we really include everyone and be able to work, share, and uh, uh, the good thing with the world now, we have uh, the so-called uh, webinars where we can all share, exchange, and be able to share the knowledge. So these are the, some of the recommendations that we want. We want our women to be equally looked at and be uh, you know, supported equally. The money has to come down to the ground level. The pastoralists, the ones who have got cows and the ones who have got camels, they want to have the um, places where they can store their milk and be able to have coolants and everything so that they can keep their milk and sell it out. They need to do that uh, 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 livestock production. They need to make sure that their farm produce is also sold somewhere. We are, because of climate change, we have realized that there is, uh, there is also uh, you know, alternative livelihoods. I know I have two minutes, but I'll take three. Uh, 
we have alternative livelihoods, especially for those who are really impacted by the climate change. And we need to see how we can be able to support that. So these are some of the issues that are very, very important. Uh, Yon talked about the, the, the scale and the research that is going on. I think this is something that needs to be supported and continue to make sure that it goes on. Like, for example, uh, Chris also mentioned the for, uh, farm forest and uh, facility, which for us, we just learned from the magazine, from the information we get from it, and we find ourselves doing some activities from there, learning by using alternative livelihoods. So these are the things that we see is important that we keep on supporting our indigenous peoples, our indigenous. The last thing I want to say, we have the uh, biodiversity uh, post-2020 global bi biodiversity f uh, framework that is being developed. Implementation will be another task. And so we really ask everyone that it's very important to make sure that we talk with our governments and really uh, uh, support this framework so that when it comes in place, we can all be able to implement and maybe change the minds of many, especially many governments and many stakeholders. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lucy. All this, your points is a very important, and I can't stop you. <laughs> and now I, want, I would like to give the floor to Kati Partanen, member of the board of the Central Union of Agricultural Producers and Forest Owners. Kati. Could you share with us more information on the importance of channeling financial resources directly to indigenous peoples and farmers to advance climate actions, which says about many people before you? Thank you, Vyacheslav. Uh, thank you so much for the discussion earlier and all the panelists. It, I think it was awesome uh, presentations um, for all of us. I will be speaking from farmers and farmer organizations from point of view. My name is Kati Pardan and I'm from Finland. I'm a farmer um, and forest owner. Um, and as uh, mentioned, I'm in the, our national farmers organizations board, but I'm also in the board of World Farmers Organization. Um, and farmers, and, and as mentioned here, indigenous people are amongst the first impacted by climate change. And we are at the heart of climate solutions. Far farmers' fundamental role in, the, in our food systems and protecting the environment must be recognized. And farmers are already contributing to global efforts and we are part of the solution. And I'm, I must say that I, I totally agree with the previous speakers about also the indigenous people's role in this. Um, I must say that risks in agriculture has been rising and due to recent input prices growth, the risk are, risks are, not, are uh, now even higher than it was, for example, about a year ago. And this is worrying us, as it seems to be all the time more difficult to get funding for investments in the farm. And um, we always have to remember that if farming is not profitable, it's not resilient. It's important to increase climate finance investments in agriculture and forestry and improved access to direct finance to family farmers, uh, their organizations and cooperatives. Um, also, we should uh, uh, identify the key gaps in strengthening the capacity of rural businesses and livelihoods and also how farmers can cope with climate and other risks. Uh, improving farmers' access to finance is critical to supporting a transition to innovative production and harvesting methods that would allow the sector to increase sustainability, carbon sequestration, and build resilience to future shocks. Agriculture's share of the, of the uh, climate finance is very, very low. Um, there is a definition that uh, only 2.2% of global climate finance is, is invested in agriculture-related sector. Um, and IFAD and CPI reports uh, state that only 1.7% of climate funding triggers down to forest and farm producers. However, this is, this is ridiculous, ridiculously so, uh, low share of the, of the climate finance. 
Funding is not needed only for future development, but also to keep farming alive. Therefore, we need urgently direct finance to locally led adaptation and for just transition to improve resilience in farming. Um, and also, uh, as mentioned, Lucy, Lucy said that there, the farming uh, and, and also farmers are very diverse worldwide. It's not the same uh, everywhere. And therefore, financial uh, interventions need to be properly customized. This requires access to affordable, tra uh, affordable trailered credit and grant mechanisms which are based on through knowledge of the sector and align with farmers' unique needs and local conditions. There is no one-size-fits-all approach. Every farming practice must be customized by farm and be both economically and environmentally sustainable to realize the full potential of agriculture in the fight against the climate change. And one solution could be specific farmer-led fund or facility to ensure inclusive decision-making and direct investments. Um, and also procedures to access climate finance must be simplified and the availability and predictability of support must be improved. Farmers are also interested um, in mar new market-based mechanisms, but these need further development to be real opportunities for farmers with much less risk. Um, and the last thing, special attention must be paid to most vulnerable people, such as small-scale agricultural producers, women, young farmers, and others directly impacted groups, especially in the least developed countries. And I must highlight the, the women's role in this. Women's access to finance is often much lower compared to the men. Empowering women in agriculture, providing them with the same opportunities as men to participate more effectively in the sector also leads to an increase in the well-being of their children, which is an investment in human capital for future generation and the sustainability and resilience of the farming sector. And therefore, reducing inequalities and empowering rural women and girls will not only improve climate resilience, nutrition, health and education outcomes, but will, will also translate into short and long-term economic and social benefits for farmers, communities and countries. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Katie. Uh, sorry, due my bad moderations, we haven't any time for to the questions, and therefore I would like to invite Jon to share some summary reflections and to close this event. Jon? Thank you so much, Vyacheslav. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, thank you so much, Vyacheslav, and uh, my thanks to all the eminent speakers and panelists, uh, of course, uh, Jessica Vega, uh, Ailis, uh, Lucy Molinke, Kathy, but also to the um, uh, colleagues that did the opening, uh, Aileen, Mairena, uh, Chris, uh, and of course, Amy. I think the discussion has been extremely important and it covers the, the breadth of initiatives that are taking place um, at, at local level uh, by farmers in the territory, by indigenous peoples, and it is really fundamental that uh, we picked up some of the key messages that have been shared by some of the panelists. So I think uh, Eilis uh, remind us of the importance of taking and putting at the center social infrastructures and initiatives like cooperatives that can really empower uh, smallholder and family farmers for them really to move forward their collective rights and ensure that the conservation and preservation practices maintain the agrobiodiversity uh, at that farming. Uh, she gave a very powerful example from the, uh, Vietnam, from the mountains by indigenous peoples that are, in this case are doing farming and the importance really on how a, a small scale farmers are actually uh, fixing carbon and sequestering carbon and uh, having resilient livelihoods that are very importantly maintained through social infrastructures and uh, cooperatives. 
It's very important as well, the message from the Sister Lucy Mullincape, the importance of including pastoralists and indigenous peoples and how indigenous women uh, see nature as a part and an extension of them. And the importance of learning from each other, from farmers, from livestock herders, uh, from indigenous women, from indigenous peoples, the importance of the collective learning for all of us to advance together and the need to support women. That was an idea that also Cathy uh, in, in her words uh, reinforced. Jessica remind us that without language, there is not indigenous knowledge and without indigenous knowledge, there's not effective territorial management that maintain the customary practices. And this is why it's so important to preserve language. And that's why we always uh, say that words matter. And this is why uh, we have learned with indigenous peoples that we need to say indigenous peoples food and knowledge systems. You cannot separate them since it's the knowledge systems that maintains the food system and it's the food system the one that preserves biodiversity. And these nexuses are very important for technicians, UN organizations, governments, practitioners to understand because very often we get it wrong. We get the wording wrong. We get the approach wrong. And then it's very difficult to fix some of the well-intended initiatives that we all have. Uh, Cathy reminds us of uh, the importance of uh, that finance reaches uh, local adaptation and how it, the, the resilience uh, of farmers can be improved when the financing is uh, diversified and it's really targeted in a customized manner through a facility to have direct investment reaching the small farmers and the importance of women in agriculture and women having uh, the same access to resources as men so that they can really maximize their opportunities and uh, the role that they have at the local level. So I think it has been an extremely interesting uh, event about the importance of upscaling uh, biocentric approaches in our work, of the, the, the need to upscale the learning, the collective learning that we are all doing from indigenous peoples, indigenous women, pastoralists, uh, small farmers, and the importance of all of us working together so that we can ensure that the funding reaches indigenous peoples in the territory, reaches the small farmers, that are doing good practices uh, that are biocentric in the territory so that we can preserve biodiversity. Uh, there is a, a, a tremendous number of different practices and it's very important to uh, concentrate on those that are preserving biodiversity and those that are doing not harm. And I think the, the importance of all of us to do better in our work and to keep learning from indigenous peoples and their food systems. In the end, indigenous peoples' food systems they were on earth much earlier than the appearance of agriculture and they are the game changers for sustainability and resilience and therefore indigenous people's food systems and knowledge systems have some of the answers for many of the practices that other actors want to uh, take up and biocentrism and their cosmogony is really at the heart of it. My thanks to you Vyacheslav for excellent moderation and over to you and congratulations for the excellent discussions and the excellent presentation. Thank you. Many thanks and thanks to all our speakers and the audience here in the Food and Agriculture Pavilion. We look forward to further advancing these discussions and ensuring that indigenous people's food systems are recognized as the key elements for climate action. Thank you. Thank you all.